Good morning, Jesus. Thank you for your presence here as the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, you loved us from the beginning. You created us. We find ourselves here in your house, Lord, wanting to worship you, wanting to feel your presence, wanting to say thank you for all you've done. Lord, I personally have seen your mighty works this week. I thank you that you were willing to humble yourself to come to make yourself known, to help us understand you, to be our friend, our savior, our Lord. Lord, be with us this morning as we lift these songs up to you as our form of worship this morning. Lord, I'm thinking of Rob Baker and Linda who serve so well here. Lord, be with them this morning. I'm sure they'll find themselves in a church this morning somewhere enjoying worshiping you there. As we join with Christians all over the world, Lord, I thank you that, that we are yours, that we can call ourselves Christians, that we can call ourselves family. Lord, be with us now. I ask that you bless Darren and his message. Speak to our hearts through him. Lord, we want to say so much, and yet words fail me. Be with us now. I ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope I didn't scare you. Started a little differently that time. Uh, I would like to make sure you know who's up here singing. Um, this is Susan Peterson. She's been a member here 25, 30 years. And this is Eric Utomo. Behind me, Eric and his family uh, had church here as part of, started out as the Indonesian Christian Church and became the church, God, Christ Church of All Nations, spent many, probably seven years here with us in the afternoons and throughout the week, and now they uh, share a facility with a Baptist uh, group, uh, I think in Pacheco, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they've always been a blessing to us. Uh, Rob was gone and we were struggling to find somebody to lead and I called up and they jumped right up and said, yeah, we can help. So thank you for that, Eric <laughs> and Church of All Nations. Uh, so we're going to do a few songs a little bit different than Rob. These are songs that the First Christian family knows well. This next song I used to say is our, the character of our church. So I won't say much more about it. I will say that the men will lead and the women will give a response for most of it. So let's see how that goes. And the women, follow Susan. You are holy. You are mighty. I 
to tell you take a deep breath okay that was half speed now we'll pick it up a little bit you ready you are holy you are holy you are mighty you are, mighty. You are worthy sit down if you would like. You don't, you don't have to. You don't have to. Fred's never going to sit down. So today, Darren's coming to speak to us about hope. I know that as we got prepared. And I, I want to read uh, a little bit out of Romans. I hope I'm not stepping on Darren's toes too much. Romans 5, 4 through 6 says, and the scriptures were written to teach and encourage us by giving us hope. So that's what the Bible's for. God is the one who makes us patient and cheerful. I pray that he will help you live in peace with each other as you follow Christ. Then all of you together will praise God, the Father, our Lord, Jesus Christ. And he jumped down to 13. He says, I pray that God who gives hope will bless you with complete happiness and peace because of your faith. And may the power of the Holy Spirit fill you with hope. Amen. It's the reading of God's word. The solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His 
his oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Darren Ford, and I'm going to, Jesus, again, I ask that you be with Darren, that you have given a message to him that you want us to hear, that you would bless us through him. Lord, I ask a blessing on him and his chaplaincy. Uh, I know he's been very busy, uh, but so happy to serve here. So thank you for that. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to see you again today. I was so looking forward to seeing you again. I've told you this before, and I will tell you again that you bless me immensely. Um, I love having an opportunity to worship with you and to, and to share the word with you. I consider you family, and just, just I want you to know that, that I, it's really been an honor and a privilege to be asked to, to be a part of your family for however long. It, it, it lasts, and, and so thank you again for having me uh, this morning. We're going to be in the book of 1 Peter now. We're starting a little series in the book of 1 Peter. It's a letter that the Apostle Peter wrote to the church, primarily Jewish Christians who found themselves outside of Jerusalem, scattered abroad. Uh, and so we, we did a little 1 John last month, uh, a letter written by the Apostle John, and now we get one written by his buddy Peter. Uh, and, and it's important to know before we begin what context the letter was written in. People are suffering. That's not altogether unusual when we find ourselves reading a letter in the back of our Bibles. The, they're called epistles um, that either Paul writes or Peter or John writes. Um, often in the context of suffering, people are going through difficult times. And that's why Peter writes the church. As John mentioned in his prayer for me, thank you, John, um, I started the chaplaincy program at UC Davis Med Center up in Sacramento two weeks ago. I think I'm going to really like it. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting field. It's an interesting place to work. And, you know, like so many things in life, you, you kind of know things. You know something about something, but until you're placed in that context, you don't really know that you know until you're there. One of the things I've come to realize, and many of you are going to go, well, yeah, of course, the hospital is not a very fun place. In fact, the hospital is a pretty miserable place. Um, it, it's a place that, that generally 90% of the people who are there don't want to be, right? Even the nurses and the doctors, they want to be there. It's their job, but it's... It's not like you don't generally find people full of joy in the hospital. Uh, there's a lot of tears. There's a lot of pain, physical and emotional. There's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of loss. The hospital is not a fun place to be, by and large. And one of the things I've realized in this, these last couple of weeks that I've been there is how hopeless the hospital is for the most part. Hope less. Yes, sir. Right. Right. The best part of the hospital is getting out. Yeah. It's a lot like prison. 
when you, when you think about it. But there's not a lot of hope there. Not a lot of hope with the patients and their families and the doctors and the nurses. Not a lot of hope. It's just generally kind of a sad, depressing place to be. And as chaplains, our job is to hopefully bring some peace to people that find themselves there. And I've realized again over the last two weeks how important hope is. How important to our faith and to our life hope is. Because without it, all is lost. I talked to a guy bedside. I was talking to Barry earlier before church. And I just, I didn't really have, I didn't really know what to say to him. This is part of the reason why I'm in school, right? I get to learn. And he's, he's an older gentleman in his, in his um, upper 80s. He doesn't have the same spiritual opinions we do here in church. He found himself, um, he was standing, he said, I was standing over a putt two weeks ago. He lives on a golf course and he said his back froze up. And he thought he was having a heart attack. And they brought him to the hospital. It turns out he's got some major spinal issues. And he's probably not going to be able to walk again. They don't know for sure, but it doesn't look good. And he said, you know what? He said, first of all, he says, why are you here? I said, well, your nurse thought you could use some company. And he says, okay. I says, well, what's going on with you? He goes, you know, I'm not, a, I, I'm not a church guy. He says, I'm not a church guy. I said, that's okay. Let's just talk, you know. I sa- he says, I don't want to be here. He says, I just as soon die. And I don't understand why they won't let me die. He says, I'm, I'm 85 years old. I've had a great life. My wife died 10 years ago. And if I can't walk again, I don't want to be a burden on my kids. And I just as soon die. And they won't let me. And I sat there and I hadn't the faintest idea what to say. And I said, I'm sorry that you find yourself in this spot, in this position. I don't know what to tell you. He goes, well, thank you for listening to me and not telling me that I'm wrong. And I said, I'm not in a position to do that, you know. And he just, I just listened to him. He was hopeless. He just, there was nothing else to live for. He had nothing else to live for. And so in our passage today, Peter, as John mentioned, is talking about hope. He knows that he's writing to a group of believers that are losing hope. And so it was important to him to write to them and encourage them in hope. And after greeting them, he says this. We're in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. After greeting them, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, that's a long sentence, and he's not even completed it yet. That's a mouthful. What is he saying here? Right out of the gate. What is he saying here? Well, he says this. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, in other words, according to means as a result of. Blessed be God, because as a result of his great mercy for us, he's caused us to be born again. Mercy. What do most of us think of when we think of God's mercy? Well, we have a tendency, I think, to think of God's mercy this way. I am guilty of my sins. God is unhappy with me because I have sinned against him. I'm disobedient. I'm a sinner. And because of mercy, he says, Darren, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. Now, there may be some theological truth in some of that. But I don't particularly like the picture that paints of God in this context. Because I don't think that's the kind of mercy Peter is talking about. What is Peter talking about when he says that God has mercy on us and as a result of that mercy, he causes us to be born again? What might that mercy look like? Well, I think it looks something like this. I think God looks down on us, his most beloved creation, who remember he created to be in relationship with him, right? 
That is why he made us to begin with. Because he longed to be, not needed, but longed to be in relationship with us. But because we fell, because we sinned, because humankind chose to disobey God and sever that relationship, that was made impossible. We could no longer have relationship with the holy God because of the decisions we made. And so God looks down at us now, his most beloved creation, in bondage to sin and death now, right? As a result of our choices and says what? I am not going to leave them in that condition. That's what his mercy looks like. I am not going to leave my sons and daughters chained up to that trailer anymore. I am going to do whatever I have to do to ensure that we have relationship with each other once again. I will not leave them in bondage to sin and as a result in bondage to death. I will not leave my people that way. No way, no how. That's what God's mercy looks like. I will do, God says, whatever I have to do to make sure my children get to know me again and we can be together again. They are not going to mess this up. Or not permanently anyways. They messed it up. But I'm going to make sure I fix that. Do you see what his mercy looks like? Because of his great mercy, Peter says, because God was going to make sure that we could have relationship with him once again, he's caused us, Peter says, to be born again. We are reborn in a sense, aren't we? I remember when I came to faith when I was 30 years old, one of my friends says, oh, you're going to be one of those born agains now? <laughs> born agains, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, we're born agains. Yep, Peter says he's caused us to be reborn. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become what? New, Paul says, right? He makes us alive, doesn't he? Really alive. We're reborn. We're, we're now alive like we were always intended to be alive. That's what God is in the business of doing, giving life to dead things. That's what he does. That's what he does. We have to be reborn, don't we? We have to have that chain cut off. We have to have him come and release us from slavery to sin and death. We need it. We require it. He has to do it. We can't on our own. And Peter says when that happens, when we are reborn, when he has, because of his great mercy for us, he's caused us to be born again, we are reborn to a what? A living hope, he says. A living hope. And what is that living hope based on? Jesus' resurrection. We are reborn to a living hope as a result of Jesus being reborn, in a sense. Wasn't he? Because Jesus was really dead... And is now alive, so are we. So are we. Easter Sunday is a picture of what happens to us when we believe. We were dead, we were made alive. That great passage that, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a frog in my throat. Ephesians 2, right? Paul writes, but we were dead in our sins and trespasses, but God. Because of his great what? Mercy for us caused us to be alive again. I want to read a quick passage. I don't normally do this, but I think it's so fitting. In 1 Corinthians 15, this is a letter Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Look what he says to them. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 54. It will sound familiar to you. But when this perishable... That is, this dead body will have put on the imperishable. And this mortal will have put on immortality. And that's what happens when we are inhabited by the Holy Spirit. And we are changed when we believe in the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. The perishable goes away. 
The imperishable comes. Mortality goes away. Immortality comes in Christ. When that happens, Paul says, then will come about the saying that is written, O death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? We're made alive again, once and for all. Baptism, right? When you're baptized, what, what, what does it symbolize? Right? Down to the grave with the old man or the woman, up from the grave with the new. Reminds me of that song, we only sing it on Easter. Why do we only sing it on Easter? Up from the grave he arose, right? We ought to sing that song all the time. Like what? We only think of the resurrection like it's, not, it's just important on Easter. <laughs> like we should sing that song every week probably. Up from the grave with the new, out with the old, in with the new. That's what God does for us. A living hope. That's what he's caused us to be born again to a living hope, Peter says. Let's unpack that, living hope. What does that mean, living hope? Well, simply put, I think it means this. Any hope you had before you came to know Jesus, any hope you had before you came to know the risen Lord, wasn't really hope, it was just optimism. <laughs> and and. I don't mean to blast optimism. Optimism can be a really good thing. Certainly, I don't mean to, 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 to trash optimism. It can be good, but it ain't certain, is it? Optimism isn't certain. It's just optimistic. <laughs> it's just, well, I'm going to think positive, and maybe it'll work out. Maybe it won't, but we're going to hope for the best, right? That's optimism. You see, optimism is rooted in what? Optimism is rooted in your circumstances. Your circumstances determine, your circumstances influence how you feel about your chances. If you're on a life raft in the middle of the ocean and there's an ocean liner coming right at you, you're feeling pretty optimistic. If you're on a life raft in the middle of the ocean and that ocean liner is sailing away from you, not so much, right? Your optimism is rooted in your circumstances. Living hope is more than that. Living hope is more than that. Living hope is guaranteed. It's not wishful thinking. It's alive. That's what it means. It's living. It means it's genuine. It means it's worthy. It means it's unassailable. It cannot falter. A living hope. Why? Because it's not rooted in circumstances. It's rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. And because that happened, life from death, you, son or daughter of God, you experienced the same thing, guaranteed. Guaranteed. It's not optimism. It's living hope because Jesus got up from the grave, you do too. Because you know him and you love him and you have him living in you in the Holy Spirit. So living hope in what? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Number one, your relationship with God has been repaired once and for all. Fixed, reestablished. That is guaranteed. You can know that. That's not optimistic. That is fact. If you are in Christ, that is true, period. No ands, ifs, or buts about it. You, Christian, if you're sitting here today and you know the Lord, you are right with God. You are not guilty. You have been set free from slavery to sin and death. And you have been united to God through the Holy Spirit. You are the very tabernacle of God. One with him. I remember I signed Jackson up, my son, for some silly little club a couple of years ago. And it came with this, this cute certificate with that old school language on it. It says, Jackson Paulson is now a member of this club. And it says, with all the rights and privileges and honors appertaining thereunto. 
Church, you are now a child of God. You are royalty, living royalty, a son or a daughter of the king with all the rights, privileges, and honors appertaining thereunto. Wouldn't it be cool if we got a certificate in the mail signed by Yahweh? You are a son. Adoption papers, right? That's what our living hope is in. Our unassailable, unshakable truth, whether we always feel like it or not. Our relationship with God has been secured. But also I think it's hope in this life too. Remember we talked about that a lot here. Our, our, our justification, our salvation, our oneness with God isn't just a life insurance policy that we stick in our pocket and say, okay, good, now when I die, I get to go to heaven. It's that, and that's wonderful, but it's not all it is. Because Jesus said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly right here, right now. I think hope in this life as well. Not optimism rooted in circumstances, but living hope in this life too. Well, well, hope in what? What about all those people you talked about at the hospital? What do we have to hope in? Well, that no matter what we face as Christians, no matter what we face, backs up against the Red Sea. Whenever I read that story, I'm always amazed at how God had arranged that they could not be in a worse position, right? There's nowhere to go. The ocean on their back, the Egyptian army coming at them from the front, there's nowhere to go. Unless and until God does something, right? No matter what we face, God is for us. God is with us. And God will never leave us alone. If we were in a Pentecostal church, I'd say, turn to your neighbor and say, God is for you. God is with you, Fred, and God will never, ever leave you alone. <laughs> know that. I think you get that tattooed on your forehead backwards so when you look in the mirror, you see that. God is for you. God is with you. God will never leave you alone. Problem is everyone would have to try to read it backwards. if They see it. But it's true. We can know it, and I know you don't always feel like it. Neither do I. It's real easy to stand up here and preach, but when you're in the hospital bed or wherever you are, sometimes it's really tough to know that and to believe that. But it's true regardless because your hope is living. Your hope is guaranteed because Jesus came back from the dead. That's true. God is always with you. God is always for you. And God will never leave you alone. And then in verse 4, Peter writes... We've also been uh, caused to be born again to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's when he finally ends that sentence. God has given us new life to, an, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable. It cannot be destroyed. It is undefiled. It is holy, set apart, and pure, and reserved in heaven for you. The inheritance just isn't heaven. It's being held in heaven for you. Like this, picture this huge safety deposit box with God in front of it. It is secured. It cannot be taken away. While you are protected by the power of God through your faith, which will result in your salvation now and later when God finishes his work on earth and all is made right again. What if you went to the snack bar at the game or at the movies and you ordered four hot dogs and three large popcorns, ten sodas, candy, yeah, you, the whole shooting match. And when the person slides you your treasure, all your stuff, and asks by what means you plan to acquire it, what if you said this to them? Well, I believe this is mine as a result of your love and your mercy for me. 
I've done nothing to earn it. I've done nothing to deserve it. But you've chosen to bless me with it because I believe you and I trust you and I believe you rescued me. That person would go, that's great. You still owe me $100, right? But that's what God does with our treasure. He, I know it's a silly analogy, so much more important and so much more beautiful than a snack bar somewhere. But think of the treasure, our inheritance in him that he has blessed us with and given us. And if he were to ask us, by what means do you plan to acquire it? We would say, I believe you. I trust you. I believe your word says you loved me much because of your so much, your, your great mercy. You wanted to make sure I could have a relationship with you and to receive this treasure. And because I believe you and I trust you and I love you, I think this is mine. And he would say, amen. Amen. You've done nothing to earn it or deserve it. I'm giving it to you because I adore you and I want relationship with you. Here it is. Have it. Live in it. Bask in it. Here is life and life more abundantly because you have understood and you have realized that life apart from me is senseless and meaningless and hopeless. And so here I've given you life and I am happy to do it. And I would quickly add, because I used to be taught by well-intended Christians that you can't tell the church that too much because then they'll walk out the doors and think, oh, that means I can do anything I want. Let me tell you something. When you grasp the truth of what I just said, of the immeasurable, matchless treasure, inheritance, blessing God bestows on us when we believe in his finished work on our behalf, that makes me want to please him. Doesn't it? That makes me want to go out these doors and say, oh my goodness, how much I love you. I want to act like I do. I want to behave like a changed person behaves. I think that that grace message leads to obedience, not sin. Verse 6, Peter says, in this truth, what I just said to you, how much mercy God has shown us and how he's caused us to be born again, reborn into a living hope that our relationship now has been reestablished, that we have an inheritance that can never perish or fade away. He says, in this you greatly rejoice. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In this you greatly rejoice. Amen, Peter. We do. That's great news. We do rejoice. But then Peter keeps it real, doesn't he? Trials. Darn it. He had to go there. We don't get to skip those, do we? He says, all of this is true. It's so true. This is why I wanted to write you and tell you it's true. So that you will greatly rejoice. Even though you probably find yourself suffering right now. You probably find yourself in a position of need right now. You probably find yourself facing some adversity and some trials right now. No, we don't get to skip those. Jesus didn't. The Bible says this is one of the most mind-blowing things that the Bible says. I would love to hear one of you guys preach a sermon on it. The Bible says that Jesus learned obedience through suffering. The creator of the world in his humanness learned obedience through suffering. We worship a God who made sure he experienced and realized and knows what it's like to suffer. Nobody else's God is like that, by the way. Nobody else worships a God who did that. We do. But he says, look, 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 look. Look at this. 
so that, so that, he says in verse 7, so that we, we go through these things so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is tested, or uh, um, um, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor. What's he saying here? When you, he's saying this, church, when you endure your trials, when you endure your suffering, when you come through them, when you come out the other side, when you emerge victorious over them, when you come through the fire, tested by fire, you will have your proof that you are his. You see, this is not proof for God. I used to read this passage and think God was up there saying, okay, you're enduring this suffering. Now I see you really love me. You've proved it to me. No, that's not what Peter is saying here. God doesn't need proof of anything. You do. I do. And we, Peter is saying, when we endure, when we come through by the grace of God, when we see his hand carry us through the valley of the shadow of death and we come out the other side, this is proof for you that you will see he never leaves you. You will see he never forsakes you. Why? Because you're his. You will see he carries you and sustains you and works it out for good for you. Why? Because you're his. You need that proof and you get that proof through your suffering. How many of you can testify this morning that you've gone through hell and back and God sustains you through it? Would you go and do it again? No, you'd gladly skip it, right? But are you glad that you learned that God won't forsake you or leave you? Yes, amen. Yes, every time. And man, I duck it and dodge it. And I, I, he, I don't think he holds that against us. It's not, that's, you'd have to be a little twisted if you enjoyed suffering. <laughs> right? He understands that. But I, I think if he would say to you, hold on. I know it's hard. I know it hurts. But I'm going to bring you through. I have before. I will again. And I know you doubt. And I'm standing up before you saying I'm the king of doubt. I know you doubt. But I'm faithful, and you're going to praise my name. You're going to see that I'm faithful. You're going to prove it to yourself again that I'm faithful. You wait and see. You hold on. Because you're mine, Darren. Insert your name here. And I will not see you go through it alone. I've got a plan in this. It's going to work out for your good in this. I sat, I got a page last night. I get a Chaplains get a page when somebody, it's so technical sounding it sounds so cold but I get a page I said hi this is chaplain there and I got a page yes we've had a patient expire I said well where is he he's on unit three bed blah 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 I said is the family there no the family just left they're probably not coming back I said okay well I'd like to come down sure so I come down I go into the room and there's the patient and he's gone it's just his body he's gone and I sat there and I was thinking about this sermon because I had been working on a little bit in the break room. And, and I was thinking about this sermon and I was sitting there next to this body. And I heard God kind of say, you know, in that, I, don't, I didn't hear a voice. You know how you just hear from the Lord and you know it's the Lord? He says, don't you think that I deserted this man? I decided to bring this man home. But you have no idea how many trials. And I'd seen on his, on his chart that he was a Christian a professed evangelical Christian. Um, I can only assume that that is true, but I felt God just kind of tell me, you have no clue. He was about 90 years old. How many trials, how many dark valleys I brought this man through over and over and over again. And I did not fail him this time either. I just decided enough was enough. And I brought him home. And I read Psalm 116 over him. It says that... Um, um, that God takes great joy in the death of his saints. Um, that he loves to bring us home when it's time for us to come home. But even if it were end to end that way, he has not failed us or deserted us. And we will praise him each and every time, like Jeremiah in Lamentations 3, right? This I recall to mind, and therefore I have what? You remember the end of that verse? 
This I call to mind, and therefore I have H word, hope. Hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. What's the next line? Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. And sometimes I hear the Lord say to me, Darren, I know it's hard, but you've got to learn it this way. This is how I'm going to teach you that I am faithful and that I will bring you through. And then in verse 8, Peter says this, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Peter closes this section by kind of complimenting his audience. You didn't know Jesus like I did, he's saying, but you love him anyway. You, didn't, you, didn't have, you don't have the memories I have. I actually got to be with him for three years or however long it was. I actually saw him do miraculous things. I was one of his closest friends. You haven't seen the proof like I have. And yet you still believe. I think Peter is, I don't know this, I'm kind of reading this into the text, but I think Peter is rather impressed by this. I think he's complimenting his audience. He's saying, you, don't, you didn't walk with him and talk with him like I did, yet you believe like I do. You didn't have the visual proof I had, and yet you still have great faith. You still trust in what I'm saying is true. And you know what? Your hope is alive, church. Your hope is alive, your joy, even in the midst of your pain, is real. And God sees it. And you are his. With all the rights and the privileges and honors appertaining thereunto. So church, this morning, when you find yourselves in trouble, and you might be there right now. If not now, somewhere down the road, right? Distressed by various things that are happening in your life. Don't let your circumstances determine your outlook. That's what the enemy will tell you. The enemy will tell you to, oh, insert your name here. There ain't no way God's getting you out of this one. This is certainly the end. Don't trust him, right? Don't listen. Look at the circumstances. They're overwhelming. There's no way you can come back from this. Don't you listen to him. <laughs> you have a living hope. That's not based on your circumstances, but based on the living Christ. Jesus, who was dead and got up again three days later with all power. That's what our hope rests in. Our hope is grounded in the reality of his life. He arose. He arose with a mighty triumph for his foes, right? He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints proclaim. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Because he got up again, we do too. Because he rose from the grave, we do too. Not just in the afterlife, yes sir, amen, we certainly do, but in this life as well. Take heart, believe, and watch how God raises you up again. Amen. Lord, God, I praise you, Lord, and thank you that you are alive. You are a living, living God. You're standing there wherever you are, with us, beside us, above us, below us, alive. With the scars still on you from the suffering you endured so that you would know what your people go through so that you could relate to us, so that you could show us what it's like to trust and believe and to come through the other side. But God, we confess this morning that, that, that it's real easy to preach it. It's real easy to say amen to it, God. But when we're by ourselves, when we're in the car, when we're at the house, when we're at the job, Lord, it's, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would remind us every day how precious we are in your sight. The great lengths you went to to rescue us and deliver us and to give us new life, a living hope, an inheritance that would never perish or fade away. 
Help us to remember that our hope is not based in our circumstances, but it's in the living, risen Messiah. Encourage us today, Lord, and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 people who say that they're a Christian but you can't tell by looking at them the way they act, what they do yeah, I know some of those are but the, um, when I was working this week I was eating my lunch and I looked over and I saw a bald eagle I was like oh a bald eagle but then uh, what he was doing he was eating out of the trash can I was, I was like, so I wanted to go right over there and say look here bald eagle do you know who you are what you, re what you represent what you stand for and I but then, then I got to thinking, you know, yeah, you know, I got to thinking about our lives as humans. You know, some of us do things that we don't. You know, when we're when we are Christians, we say we're Christians. We represent Christ. That's what we represent. So we're eating garbage. We're doing sinful things. It's. I mean, that's not a very good representation, in, in my opinion. So and um. And verse. In the book of John, verse 1, chapter 12, it states, But as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Let us pray. Lord, we come before you humbly. Thank you for your wisdom, grace, mercy. Thank you for making us in your image. Let us be deserving to be called children of God, the Most High. In Jesus' name. So everyone get their communion elements ready, please. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he, he broke bread and spread it among his disciples and said, eat, eat this. And in the same way, he took the cup, this has been, this has been blood, Spilled out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you very much. Well, you ever hear the expression, be careful what you pray for? Someone reminded me that last week, and when, uh, when, it, when I realized I needed to uh, lead worship, because Rob is on vacation, um, I thought, oh, I don't have anything to say. Rob's so good. And then God came along and gave me something to tell you, so I'm going to actually take a moment and give you a little testimony about this. And... Uh, Darren, I knew he had a chaplaincy, but I wasn't quite sure where. This was going to work right into that. So on Thursday night, my grandson came home from school. He let, they live in Chico. He's five. He just started kindergarten. And he had spots on his legs that looked like flea bites or maybe hives from rolling in the grass or something. But they were getting worse and worse. So he called the uh, daughter, called the pediatrician they went to the pediatrician in a few minutes the pediatrician said take them to emergency take them to emergency and they start giving them IVs and oxygen and all kinds of pretty what seems pretty serious to me and they came them overnight and the next morning they transfer them to UC Davis they got a really great pediatric department there so Susan and I fly up there and I, I give you a suggestion, there's nobody in the pediatric wing that's saying, well, we've had them for five years, we're a little tired of them anyhow, you know. Uh, there's nobody there that doesn't want hope. Uh, and so for 48 hours, he was getting pretty bad. 
he looked like acid burns all over his body. Um, but then it started to turn around. And uh, by Saturday evening, he was good enough to go home. They say no scarring. Uh, it'll all go away. It's a combination of medicine and a flu at the same time. They're not quite sure, but we can see him so much better. So thank you, God, for that. Thank you for all you that prayed for us. Um, it was great. And uh, so be careful what you pray for. I wanted to be able to say something, but thank you. So and now I'm going to read, you know, our announcements. And, you know, we say, oh, um, Chuck was sick, and we want to pray for him. But it, you go through something like that, and it really means something. You know, you don't just think, oh, poor Chuck. You want to lift him up. Um, so I'm going to say Barry's brother and sister-in-law, Arnie and Lynn, they've been missionaries over in India for quite a while. And they, they both have serious health issues. Um, and now they're both back in the States looking for their next ministry. So I want to lift them up for Arnie's back and Lynn uh, follow up to serious colon surgery. Uh, and uh, their ministry opportunities, they're still looking to serve. Um, praise for my grandson. And uh, I, I say a praise that uh, Darren finds himself in a place where he can help people at a point of need. Uh, we got vacationers, uh, Rob and Linda. Uh, they'll be back next week. And Gary and Linda Hiesel, um, they're touring uh, national parks in the Midwest. So uh, I want you to lift them up for safety, but also, you know, that they get the chance to recharge their batteries. Uh, join us in prayer for our, our church. Continue to pray that God will be leading us. Uh, we started talking about uh, our spiritual survey that we are taking. Uh, we are going to be sharing this with everybody that comes to church here uh, to help us assess how you feel about where we are and where we want to head, preparing a table for the Lord. And you'll hear more about that as we move on. I want to thank uh, Pastor Darren. We had Pastor Roger Gibson last week. We've had Michael Senti uh, next week. Barry's going to bring us the message. So, you know, we've had people come, great messages, you know, fresh views and looks. I still remember Darren's dog on the chain analogy. That's a, that's a great one. Um, but they also have come along as coaches to help us as leaders, you know, help us set that table that we're talking about. Uh, so that's it. Uh, I apologize that I haven't gotten the the church family directory out. It's been a kind of a busy time for me. Uh, and I said last week, oh, I'm definitely going to do it this week. And I got a testimony instead. Um, our new class, uh, Barry Swan's directing a new class, The Names and Claims of Jesus. Okay. Uh, who, is, who Jesus is and the I am claims that he made. Uh, so that's a good one. Uh, just started. It's not too late to get in there. Uh, I know you will enjoy it. It takes place uh, right down the hall here after service today. On Wednesday nights, we still have uh, the Sermon 2.0 where we go over the Bible verses. We get an opportunity to interact, go back and look at other verses that support that, uh, get a little bit different context. And uh, on Thursday night, we have a word-by-word -word detailed uh, study if you're interested in something like that, we're in Ecclesiastes right now. Uh, speak with me, and we'll, it's in a private home. We'll get you set up, okay? And uh, that's what I have for this. Um, I'm going to close with a quick song and a word of prayer. Would you stand up with me? And we're going to sing, Seek Ye First. Seek ye first the King. Of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Ask and it shall be. Given. 
Father, thank you for the hope that you have given us. Lord, not just an optimism, but an honest, heartfelt, know it in our bones, hope that says how much better things are now that we're with you. You are always with us. How much better things are now that we commit to live a life that reflects you. We don't have to eat the garbage anymore, Lord. You set a feast for us. How much better it is when we go through that valley of darkness that we have brothers and sisters to come alongside and pray for us. To know that, that we care as a family. Lord, I thank you for the rains as they come in and permeate the ground and it's been so long. I want to thank you for Church of All Nations, Lord, as they permeate the community and their willingness to come alongside brothers and sisters and help. Even just for a small thing, like to sing a few songs. It's because we're family. You're our Father. That we can sing to you, Lord. Be with us this week. Help us to share that love and that hope with someone that's dazed. Life has slapped them upside of the head. They don't have to be in a hospital. They don't have to be homeless. When we don't think we have problems is when we have our greatest problems, Lord. Thank you for the words written by Peter, written by Paul, trying to express that love that you have for us, Lord. We'll study it sometimes all our lives and never know but it's how we love our children, how we love our families. It's how we love you. Be with us this week. And I ask for this through the strength and power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.